I am Richard Westerby, and welcome to the IVF Daddies podcast, where we discuss all things IVF and surrogacy. A disclaimer, I'm not a doctor, nor a lawyer. I'm just a dad who, 12 years ago, went through the surrogacy process to have my miracle twins. Since then, I have discovered my passion, which is helping others to create families and providing optimism during their road to parenthood. Chapter 5. Choosing an Egg Donor and Creating Embryos Twelve years ago, I was working in finance, from 7am to 6pm, coming home exhausted, and I was spending my evenings trawling the internet, getting frustrated at the amount of irrelevant information. Finding an egg donor was a very emotional time, because the ability to find quality information on egg donation was limited, and I had no idea what I was doing. I spent many hours going through endless profiles of egg donors from different agencies that I had contacted online. Each presented their donors in a different way, making it very dehumanizing and complicated to understand. This is a deeply personal decision and there is no right or wrong. But for me, the two main decisions around choosing my donor were around costs and type of relationship with the egg donor. I didn't realize that there were three types of relationship an anonymous egg donor, where you choose a profile that has all the information, but you will never be able to have actual contact with her, a semi-known egg donor, where you can have contact at some stage in the future, a known egg donor, someone that you can be in contact with before and after the donation, and you can have a continued relationship with her. For example, a friend or family member would fit into this category. Costs are directly related to the way you choose your egg donor. Coming from a privileged position, I chose to work with an egg donor agency who facilitated a Skype call with my top pick. This is the most expensive way to pick a donor as you're paying agency fees in addition to the IVF clinic fees. I have a known donor who I met before the donation because I wanted my children to have the option to contact her in the future. Once a year, we email each other and we both love receiving this information, which reassures me that I made the right decision. Pros and cons of working with an agency. Pros. They can find donors from all over the United States and abroad. Cons. They are not necessarily pre-screened donors and you pay agency fees. I took a risk on working with a first-time donor. I chose her solely on her looks, as no one told me that in fact egg quality and quantity is equally as important. As she wasn't screened, she also had a lower compensation level. Experienced donors have not only been screened, but also they have donated eggs, and this real data makes for better decision making. Typically, compensation increases with each egg donation. At this point, I assumed incorrectly that all egg donors were fully medically screened. A little terminology. What is medical screening? An egg donor will be tested to see how many eggs her body produces every month, her antral follicle count, or AFC, and how many eggs her body has left in her system, tested via anti-malarian hormone, or AMH. Also, she will be tested for any sexually transmitted infections, or STIs. The least expensive way to find a donor is to work with a family member or a friend. I did not want to ask any of my female cousins, so that route was out. My best friend offered me her eggs, which was amazing. However, like with traditional surrogacy, I wanted to always think that I was 100% the parent. I did not want to have any friction in our relationship if she disagreed with my parenting style, and I didn't want to lose my best friend if we disagreed on anything else, as I wanted her to be a key part of my family. I was not sure if she would be offended about me turning down her eggs. So we went out for dinner, and over a bottle of wine, it took me a while to get around to saying no. When I did, she was totally cool about it. Another roller coaster mountain that I had made up in my mind. Pros and cons of using a friend or family member. Pro, a deep connection with your family. Cons. It could create fiction. They could be too involved. Now, let's talk about costs. In my opinion, the best option to keep costs down is to work with an IVF clinic's donor database. 
they have no agency fee, donors have been pre-screened, and generally the egg donors live close to the clinic. All of which can save you possibly up to about 30% of the cost of making your embryos. Pros and cons of choosing through your IVF clinic. Pros, no agency fees, donors are pre-screened, and costs are minimized. Con, there is a limited amount of donors as the clinic will only recruit close to the clinic. Unlike with surrogates, finding a donor through your clinic doesn't have a conflict of interest as there are very specific medical data required to be an egg donor and so that you know from the start whether the donor is a good candidate or not. This medical data goes into her profile alongside educational and genetic history and a lot more information so that you can make an informed choice. I looked at the photos in her profile and my donor is very pretty. However, I also noticed how handsome her brother and father were, so I knew that she was the great choice for me. At this point, I had my sperm and egg donor, and that was the part when everything lay within the hands of the clinic. All I could do was wait. It was emotional and unsettling as the decision-making was no longer mine. When I chose her, I didn't really think about the impact of her being a first-time donor, making me question if she had understood what she was getting herself into, especially with the injections or the effect that the medications would have on her and if the eggs would grow successfully. After 11 days of injections, they retrieved 12 eggs that were then fertilized. These were grown in the lab and on day five, I found out how many embryos were going to be frozen. This was another few days of an emotional roller coaster because one thing I had not understood was that every day there in the lab, the number of embryos drops. I was terrified that all this time, emotion, and effort would end up with me having no embryos. From the initial 12, it dropped and dropped. Though thankfully, on day five, there was a total of six embryos for freezing. Why were the embryos frozen? There is no difference in success between fresh or frozen embryos. So the clinic focuses on the egg donor to maximize the number of eggs to retrieve without having to worry about the logistics around the surrogate. By freezing embryos, you get the option to do an embryo biopsy, or PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, which is where a few cells are biopsied from the outer cells of the embryo and open up to see the number of chromosomes inside. If there are 46, then the embryo is deemed chromosomally normal. Why do PGTA? Two main reasons. Number one, most miscarriages happen in the first trimester due to a chromosome abnormality. So although PGTA does not guarantee a pregnancy, it does minimize the risk of a miscarriage. Number two, by looking at chromosomes, you can tell if they are XX or XY. So you can tell the sex. Four questions to ask at this point. Number one, what type of relationship do you want with your egg donor? Number two, is your egg donor an experienced donor? Number three, do you want to do PGTA? Number four, do you want to know the sex of the embryos? If you enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about IVF and surrogacy, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, please share and follow our social media handle at IVF Daddies. We are here to answer any questions and to guide you through this very personal process.